these executive orders and they, you know, they kind of uh, were able to mold the Supreme Court to their view, that kind of draconian thing takes a pretty strong supermajority to establish. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're trying to prevent something like that happening to Bitcoin, uh, having some degree of bipartisan support or kind of like, like mixing things up to some degree gives you defense against some of those extreme outcomes of like, say, trying to ban Bitcoin or I, I think other things like various um, hostilities towards the idea of privacy in general. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the more that you can educate different parts of the electorate and different, you know, members of different political parties, at the very least, you you reduce the probability of extreme negative legislation from occurring. And then around the margins, you can get some positive legislation. Lynn Alden, a superb macro analyst and originator of the Lynn Alden investment approach, has a finance and engineering background. Alden always captures the various flaws of the global monetary system and the urgent need for a sounder substitute. An advocate and Bitcoin enthusiast, Alden is certain that Bitcoin is the best alternative to the debt-based fiat system and that everything else pales in comparison. Alden is confident that Bitcoin's fixed supply, decentralized system, and strong network will solve many of today's financial and economic issues. The fixed supply prevents governments and corporations from printing more to satisfy their insatiable greed, and the decentralized system protects people's rights from tyrannical regimes or even democratic ones that have been knuckled. Alden discusses the many pitfalls of the fiat monetary system and how the gradual transition to Bitcoin will help the world heal in a recent interview with a progressive Bitcoiner. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. So I, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem is large and diverse enough that there's people with different expertise. Uh, and so, you know, some people are just kind of heads down building, right? You know, mm -hmm. they're technologists. Uh, but there are, I think, really valuable slots for people that are, you know, interested in Bitcoin and also interested in politics mm -hmm. to do their best to make footholds in terms of either educating people around Bitcoin, um, trying to prevent kind of um, problematic legislation that would you know, make it harder to be to, to be in Bitcoin, to use Bitcoin, things like that. So I do think that that's valuable. Um, and I think that, you know, Bitcoin is something that's it's powerful, it's robust, but I wouldn't describe it as invincible. And then even if something was invincible, the, the time with which it takes for that to grow larger can be slowed down by other very powerful forces. Mm -hmm. um, and so to the extent that you don't want your own country to to be slowed down in that regard, I think it's important to engage in the political process, or at least for some members of the of the ecosystem to engage in that political process. And that's one reason I, you know, I try to uh, share um, uh, Jason's uh, progressive case for Bitcoin. I mm -hmm. think that, that that kind of work is valuable. And I like to see more of that because and I, I like how Peter McCormack described it as that's the most important book for conservatives. Ironically, mm -hmm. because it's like, and the way I would add to that is like, that's like protecting your left flank, right? If you're only speaking to um, Republicans, um, you can have problems from the left as it comes to Bitcoin due to them not understanding it or being more hostile towards it. Whereas if you have a part of the progressive side that understands and appreciates Bitcoin, that's now like a some degree of bipartisan defense for the mm -hmm. network. And it, it can make the lives of Bitcoiners um, less hard in that environment. And, you know, overall, I think that that's, um, you know, I think that that's just valuable work to be done. And when you see kind of very extreme political environments, like for example, it was illegal to own gold uh, from, from the mid 1930s to the mid 1970s in the United States. So in the mm -hmm. land of the free, you couldn't own a benign yellow metal because in many ways they viewed that as the apex predator to the dollar. They wanted to right. depeg the dollar, then they wanted to float the dollar. Um, the dollar was devaluing, and so when when you're kind of doing a, a type of financial repression, generally you have to block things that are stronger than you, right? So they mm -hmm. didn't have to block money flowing to like a weaker country, but weaker countries had to try to block their value from flowing to the U.S. And really, the only thing the U.S. had to block was money flowing into gold. Mm -hmm. um, and but that was only possible because you had such a sweeping victory um, by by one political party. I mean, at one point they controlled like seventy percent of Congress, and when they did these executive orders and they you know they kind of uh, were able to mold the Supreme Court to their view, 
that kind of draconian thing takes a pretty strong supermajority to establish. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're trying to prevent something like that happening to Bitcoin, uh, having some degree of bipartisan support or kind of like, like mixing things up to some degree gives you defense against some of those extreme outcomes of like, say, trying to ban Bitcoin or I, I think other things like various um, hostilities towards the idea of privacy in general. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the more that you can educate different parts of the electorate and different, you know, members of different political parties, at the very least, you you reduce the probability of extreme negative legislation from occurring. And then around the margins, you can get some positive legislation. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be a lot of time until uh, the capital gains tax situation is different because one of the main ways that countries uh, maintain their own little currency bubble, their own little currency monopoly, is by only accepting their currency as tax and by putting a capital gains tax on any other asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, uh, my preference would be towards, you know, other monies not having a capital gains tax um, so that Bitcoin should be spendable without being capital gains taxed. Um, but I think realistically, that's going to be a longer term solution. And so when I think politically, it's more like, OK, what can be done first to prevent like the extreme negative outcomes? And then from there, how can you start advancing some maybe more constructive um, type of legislation? It's been a little over a month since the U.S. national debt reached an unbelievable $33 trillion on September 16th. Today, it has risen to $33.67048. Dollars deficits are expected to reach over 10% of GDP in less than seven years. That doesn't take into account the country's huge and quickly growing unfunded liabilities or the need for more money to be spent on defense decarbonization or any other cause the U.S. government chooses to work on in the next few years. In addition, the Treasury Department plans to issue another $9.2 trillion in debt in the next few months to cover the nation's growing deficits and huge interest costs. The issue is that there aren't many overseas buyers left. U.S. banks, which are usually big buyers, are still losing money on purchases they made in the past. This means there is less demand for us bonds, which means yields have to be jacked up over and over to attract buyers. This means we will have higher deficits and more debt, followed by even higher interest rates. It's a terrible debt-death spiral that could swallow us all up. This is just one of the many reasons why people who believe in sound money, like Alden, want to move on to better options. Let us go back to the talk. And I think, you know, the larger the network is, the more people use it, the more they see benefits from using it, um, the more, as you say, the tide shifts and the more people kind of, you know, the, the more popular it would be to have a bill that says, okay, the first, you know, X number hundred of dollars worth of Bitcoin transactions are not taxed, for example. Mm. Um, and right now, if you were to run a poll on something like that, most people don't care because most yeah. people don't use Bitcoin. Whereas once you get that number much higher, that becomes more of a, a preference. And then there's also the idea of like the intransient minority, which is basically that, it, you know, you don't have to, have to necessarily be the, the majority to get something view, but you have to be a large enough like voting block or like it, the people that really care about that issue, pushing it pretty hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you get kind of a, you don't necessarily need half of Americans to be interested in Bitcoin, but if you get a much larger minority group, that's like Bitcoin is one of the most important things that they view and that they're the things they're, con they're contacting their politician about, that starts to become more and more of a reality. I think that's probably still some number of years away. Mm -hmm. um, and so far what we've generally seen is that smaller countries have a little, been a little bit more nimble at trying things because they're kind of sometimes they're in a position of like nothing to lose, right? So they're like, well, like we're going to take risks and we're going to adopt Bitcoin. Or you see um, countries that are kind of already wealthy city state type places saying, okay, we're going to be a, a place where Bitcoin and crypto companies can come and have kind of looser regulations and we're going to kind of experiment or embrace newer technologies and we're going to capture any sort of maybe taxable income that, that could come from. You know, being a more friendly environment to those, but the United States, because of its um, focus on the strength of its capital markets and the focus on its reserve currency, I think is inherently just kind of going to be one of the slower markets for uh, embracing it. Because you know, incumbents rarely disrupt themselves, even when it would benefit, like be beneficial for them to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so usually, you have startups disrupting blue chip companies. You don't really see blue chip companies constantly disrupting themselves because they end up being too comfortable in the position they already have. Uh, and that's of course a risk if you 
if you want America to do well, or if you want your blue chip company to do well, if you're a part of it, you want them to disrupt yourself because that's that's how you stay in the game for the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think while it, it would be good for the United States to take a more proactive role on Bitcoin, um, I think that realistically, we're probably not going to be ahead of the pack because we are we are the incumbent. We are the ones that are comfortable with the design of the current system, or at least the mm. the elites are the you know kind of the heads of the corporations, heads of the government, heads of you know kind of the the heads of various power structures are generally liking the current system. They I, I don't view the actions as being very constructive. Um, I I think he does seem to favor Bitcoin more than broader crypto, uh, but I wouldn't mm. necessarily consider him a strong supporter of Bitcoin either, based on his actions. Um, I, it seems maybe a lot of it has to do with just steps he can take to advance his own career, uh, you know, within mm. the current administration, which is not particularly Bitcoin or crypto favorable, right? So if he was kind of a staunch supporter of Bitcoin in this administration, that could potentially reduce his career uh, chances. Um, but, you know, I don't want to read too much into it because, like I said, I don't know the person. But, for example, there are a number of countries now that have a spot Bitcoin ETF. Uh, it doesn't really have any problem tracking the price. Um, you know, there's already Bitcoin futures that are allowed. Um, and so the, the SEC's approach of allowing all of these like derivative types of products, but not allowing a spot ETF has in many cases hurt customers more than anything else. I mean, they either, mm -hmm. they either go into, um, you know, Bitcoin trusts like GBTC that they can lose, um, you know, they can trade deeply at a discount to their net asset value with no way to reconcile that. So they can get trapped in that situation or they can do futures-based ETFs, which which over the long run, run tend to underperform their underlying asset due to losing money to those rolling futures. Um, and so I think that ironically, the thing that would support some of these entities is allowing a spot ETF. But I think that partially they don't want to do that because that's somewhat constructive for price more than mm -hmm. these kind of cash settled uh, derivative based types of products. So, and we've seen in kind of court filings. Alex Gladstein, who Alden talks about, is the chief strategy officer of the Human Rights Foundation, a nonprofit that works to promote and protect human rights around the world, especially in closed societies. Gladstein has said that Bitcoin stands for free speech, property rights, and open capital markets, which weaken the power of oppressive governments. Gladstein is a Bitcoin advocate. If a democracy breaks down, Bitcoin can fix it and stop the government from being corrupt by limiting its ability to control people. I believe this is definitely linked to Fedot currency, and I believe Bitcoin can fix this in the same way he said. What did you think of Lynn Alden's interview? Do you agree that Bitcoin is the only good way to change the world's money system? Please leave your thoughts and comments below, and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. If you want to see more movies, subscribe to the channel and turn on the bell icon. Thanks for watching.